Time now to consider projectile motion. And we're going to be working near the surface of the Earth for most problems. Sometimes it will not say that uh, you're near the Earth. We'll just talk about a sport or uh, some other happening common to everyday life. You have to go ahead and yourself use the assumption that uh, the acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. And notice that's only in the y direction. So that's uh, how we obtain some uh, information on a sub y. We're going to assume we're moving near the surface of the Earth. It's the Moon or Mars. The problem will say that. But just assume everything's near the Earth. We are going to ignore air resistance. So that uh, eliminates a complication of having an acceleration in the x direction and eliminates the compl complication of changing uh, minus 9.8 meters per second squared to something uh, that's a combination of gravity and air resistance. Something again to be very careful with. The problem will have two parts. It will have a horizontal part where the x uh, numbers will be used there'll be a vertical part to the problem where the y numbers will be used. The only communication between these uh, two uh, equations, the x and the y, takes place through the time. The time number will be the same for both the x equation and the y equation. Um, so what is the only equation for motion in the horizontal direction? Well, if the acceleration is zero, take a look at the uh, uh, equations of motion, the four equations we've been working with, if the acceleration is zero, then they simplify to just distance equals rate times time. That rate in the x direction will be a constant because the acceleration is zero. The velocity is not changing. So we can use distance equals rate times time in the horizontal direction. That's illegal in the vertical direction. The acceleration due to gravity changes the rate. Uh, so we have to use the full set of four equations in the vertical direction. So an example of kicking a soccer ball, and it's launched at some uh, velocity at some angle. Some later time, its position is at the end of this uh, S vector. And there's been uh, the more interesting part of the motion in the Y direction. That's where the acceleration is. Then you can tell a little bit from the, the line that's there is the ball is not going as fast upward um, as it did before. Ignoring air resistance, the ball should have the same progress, the same number of meters per second in the x direction. So another example, take a look at these velocity vectors. The red is the vertical velocity vector. There's no arrow. Is that just a mislabeling here? at the top of the motion. Well, at the top of the motion, the vertical component of the velocity is zero for an instant. The ball goes up for an instant. It's, it stops and then it comes back down. What's true about the acceleration due to gravity during this uh, process? Minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Is the acceleration zero up at the top of the motion? You should say no. The acceleration is always minus 9.8 meters per second squared. For problems we do, will be near the surface of the Earth for almost uh, all of them. And consequently, we'll take the acceleration number to be a constant. We need that in order to use the four equations of kinematics. The acceleration must be constant. So in the x direction, the velocity is constant because the, there's no acceleration in the x direction. But in the vertical direction, there's a lot of change going on to the velocity. Object is slowing down, coming to rest for an instant, and then being accelerated back towards the surface of the Earth. Um, so this is breaking down the motion. You can look at it. It happens all at once, of course. But uh, we can simplify our work in the x direction only because the acceleration is zero in the x direction. And we can use distance equals rate times time in the x direction only. Uh, in the y direction, we have to use our four kinematic equation. So let some of that sink in. Fireworks, they're not launched 
totally vertically. They're at least launched at a very large angle to the horizontal, uh, so 75 degrees in this example. And the, the V naught, this is at 75 degrees. You cannot use V naught in the horizontal equation or the vertical equation. Your first step would be to uh, break this into components and then do a calculation. Um, so the shell is exploding at its highest point in its trajectory. You might see if you can work this out. We'll, if I remember, we'll, we'll do this in class. Uh, they have a maximum height. They have a certain downrange uh, distance of 125 meters. We'll see if we can confirm if they're right or not. Uh, another example here of the volcano, a rock coming out, and the rock landing at a different height than where it launched. Again, the first step here would be to find the components of the velocity, find the x component, find the y component, then you can work your way piece by piece. You can get the time up to the top, and you then we'll know the distance down to the minus 20 level, and you can calculate the time in the air. Um, and the other properties of the motion. So we'll see some more examples like that as well. But the first step in these types of problems, find the x and y components, and then many times we'll do the y part of the motion first and come up with the time in the air. Then we'll do the x part of the motion that would calculate the range for that particular object. Um, just some general things about this projectile motion. Here we're always launching at 45 degrees, but we have three different speeds at the launch. So why is it that when the speed goes up, the range goes up? We're further down range. Well, there are two reasons. When the velocity magnitude increases, now we're getting a bigger velocity in the y direction. The object can go up higher and be in the air longer. In the x direction, the x component of the velocity is larger as we go up here, and we have the fact that we're in the air for a longer time, so distance equals rate times time, uh, that time factor being larger, we're going to get a, a bigger range. The angle of launch has an effect here. All the velocities have the same magnitude, but one launched at 15, one at 45, one at 75. Um, the optimum is 45. It's a compromise. At 45 degrees, you'll notice sine of 45 is the same as cosine of 45. So we have equal velocity vertically component and uh, matches the velocity component horizontally. So it's a trade-off. We're getting some time in the air, sort of a medium amount of time in the air. And with the uh, medium launch angle of 45 degrees, um, this green path is going to be in the air longer. Uh, but at 45 degrees, we're also getting a substantial component in the x direction. And we can use distance equals rate times time. Um, if we're on the green path, then we've got a bigger time in the air. But the x component of the 75 degree velocity is a small number. So if we have a high angle then we don't have much velocity in the x direction if we have a low angle then our time in the air is smaller and there is symmetry here uh, 75 plus 15 is 90 degrees and these uh, two angles produce the same range ignoring air resistance um, and there are other angles you could pick um, 30 degrees and 60 degrees would be a, a pair. You might try to think of some others. But 45 degrees is the optimum launch angle when air resistance is ignored. It's a compromise. We have a good y velocity, so we get uh, time in the air that's reasonably good. And we have a good x velocity, so distance equals rate times time. That rate is, uh, is a good, uh, good value. We get a big distance traveled. Um, imagine trying to put something in orbit by firing from a large tower. We have this acceleration due to gravity. And if we fire too weakly, gravity pulls the object down to the surface. Um, we're ignoring air resistance in this problem. But as the uh, uh, speed increases of the launch, 
then the range is going to increase and eventually we can reach a, a, a speed, an initial launch speed where as the object falls towards the Earth the Earth's surface is falling away from the orbit and we get an orbit achieved. Uh, we'll talk more about this when we talk about orbits. But let's take a look at an example, a projectile motion example. Launching at 12 meters per second at ground level, angle of 28 degrees. We want to find the maximum height, the time in the air, and the range. We're going to land on level ground in this problem. First uh, step is to find the components. So y, the vertical part of the velocity, is uh, using sine function. And I came up with 5.63 meters per second. The x part of the velocity, the x component, would be 12 times cosine of 28, so 10.6 meters per second. Or a ball, you find those on the Earth. So the acceleration due to gravity is minus 9.8. Again, minus means directed downward. And at the top, when the object's not going to go any higher, the velocity, and this should have a y on it, the velocity in the y direction is 0 meters per second. Um, the velocity is decreasing as the object goes upward. It starts with uh, a component of the velocity 5.63 meters per second in the uh, y direction. But the acceleration into gravity is going to reduce that um, down to zero. So how can we proceed here? To get the maximum height, well, we don't have the time. So look at equation four. Zero is the velocity at the top of the motion. We start at 5.63, we have to square that. And then two times acceleration times the y distance, y position. And you solve this, you should solve it on your own. I came up with 1.62 meters. How about the time to the top of the motion? And use that to calculate time in the air. Just double it. If we're landing at the same height as we launch, then the time in the air is just two times the time to go upward. So we have this equation one, zero velocity at the top, 5.63, our initial y velocity. 9.8 is a negative, it's in the y direction, and then the time to go upwards. So that turns out to be 0.574 seconds um, if we're doing this calculation. Time in the air is double that. So from launch till the object comes back to the ground, 1.15 seconds. The range then can be calculated once we know the time in the air and we know the rate in the x direction. So we have those numbers. I came up with 12.2 meters for the x value. So you have some control here. You, know, you could try doing your own calculation, changing the angle. Uh, if you change it towards 45, you're going to get a bigger range. Or you can change the uh, meters per second number, reduce that, and see that the range gets smaller as you work through here. So that's where we're going to stop this uh, video. Keep reading, keep asking questions.